Sorry about all the paraphernalia, there, but <laughs> Giles is doing some videoing, and I've got a GoPro on there as well. So I need a couple of microphones because we've got one for PA and one for the, well, several for the GoPro. Um, You've so I don't know. You've already got then. You're wired up. Yeah, I'm wired. <laughs> So I don't know how many of you were here last year, last autumn, when I uh, described what I was going to do to a, a shadow to turn it into electric. Um, it was a radical plan um, because you're limited to the size of propeller that you can put on a shadow. I was going to move the boom from up top to low down um, so that I could put a big propeller on you got much more clearance then. A uh, big propeller is much more efficient. But um, not many people like the idea of that because they want to see, most people want to see an ordinary shadow converted to electric. So I've been persuaded. Um, but if I had put the boom lower down, it would have meant uh, some quite radical changes. Um, for instance, the it would have turned it into a tail dragger. And so that the fin would have had to have been reversed from coming out underneath to on top. Uh, so I was just trying that out on, on Hotel Tango across the way. Just to see what it looked like. I think you'd want to reverse... Uh, well, the, the, these fins have been reversed as well, so that the, the slope of the trailing edge is kind of the same as that slope there. Didn't look right the other way around, so... Um, so that's what would have happened, except that I've been persuaded to keep the boom where it is now. Adrian, who persuaded you to, to do that? Uh, lots of people, including you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, this, this is going to work better as a, uh, a to and fro rather than a lecture. So feel free to butt in, <laughs> except you. <laughs> So it would have been fairly radical to do that. Um, obviously, you'd have to move the main undercarriage forward to turn it into a tail dragger, get rid of the nose leg, which would save weight and drag. It would have been an excellent idea, uh, and a much bigger propeller is much more efficient. And that really is important with electric power, where you're limited uh, with the amount of battery you can carry. So that's the fin sitting on top of the boom, the, the elevator, Teleflex would have needed to be rerouted. So a lot of work in doing that. And I, I actually found a spare boom. What I was going to do was to chop the boom, uh, well, remove the original boom, put it lower down, um, put it where the rear tank is on a shadow, feed it through into the fuselage, anchor it there. Um, and I was going to find a spare boom to put back at the top to mount the motor on, and then that would give quite a long... Uh, quite a, a large clearance uh, for the propeller down to the boom. So I found a, a boom which had got some damage um, beyond where I needed it. I was going to chop it off before that damage, so it was ideal. I lined everything up to do this and then I was persuaded not to. <laughs> so it was dented, uh, it was in a hangar, shadow in a hangar, uh, and a beam fell on it and dented the boom. Uh, they tried to uh, push the dent out, but I think they had to replace the boom eventually. Anyway, um, that was last autumn when I was last here giving a talk. Um, and I, I said the plan was to find a dead shadow uh, and convert that, rather than converting my um, current one over there, because then I can be a bit more radical. Um, so I, I managed to find one in um, November uh, close to where I live, down in Dorset. Uh, luckily, it, it was uh, available without an engine. Um, it was a f uh, an abandoned um, <coughs> restoration project by the last two owners. Hasn't flown since 2008, but it was ideal for what I want. So um, I fetched it uh, last November and started working on it a bit over the winter. But of course, it has to be mostly outside and it was a bit cold over the winter so I didn't get that much done. Um, and I borrowed, well I actually borrowed a trailer that uh, Joe had bought from the Isle of Wight. 
on, on the understanding that I went and fetched yeah. it from the Isle of Wight. Yeah, but it's only because I hate big ships and I'm too scared <laughs> to go on a big ship to go and get it. So I just asked Adrian to bring it up, bring it over for me. And he could borrow it for a couple of months for his project. So he lent it to me over the winter. <laughs> Uh, so I drove it over the Isle of Wight, fetched the trailer back and then went to Henstridge to pick up the shadow, bring it back home. Um, so it wasn't in bad condition, the, the shadow, it was airworthy. Um, uh, sorry, it was um, structurally sound and would have, would have been airworthy, um, but it needed recovering um, various other bits and pieces. So not much wrong with it. So I started taking off the, um, the covering and, and cleaning up the glue. Um, there's a comparison here. Well, the one on the right is before cleaning off all the glue. That's the worst part of restoring a shadow, cleaning off all the bostic that was originally used. It, it can be much worse than that. And of course, all of these, all of these rivets are steel. They're plated steel, but they go rusty when they're in contact with the plywood because that absorbs moisture. So I've replaced all of the rivets with stainless steel. Um, another thing I've done is, um, this is the, the U-channel that sits next to the boom. This is the tailplane. It's just a simple uh, aluminium U-channel and it tends to be pulled in by the fabric when the fabric is shrunk. So to make it stiffer, I've put some foam in uh, styrofoam with a wood veneer on this side to form a sort of beam and, and that stiffens it up enough so that it doesn't get pulled in by the fabric. Glued in? Uh, yes, it's, it's glued in with just polyurethane uh, glue, uh, expanding polyurethane glue. It's not going to take a lot of stress. Um, the, the elevator hadn't been uncovered. So I I took the covering off that and, and we've got the same problem here. Uh, the plywood absorbs the moisture and turns the rivets rusty and all of this glue of course which has got to be cleaned off. So that's a bit laborious and, and the easiest way is just to scrape it off with a Stanley knife or something like that. This is the trim tab. Uh, this electric shadow is going to be very much a, a one speed aircraft. It won't need to go fast to cover big distances so I'm going to do away with the trim tab altogether. Getting rid of the trim tab and uh, the trim motor, all the cable, the long cable that goes down to the cockpit and, and the switch and display and everything gets rid of quite a lot of weight um, and uh, I decided if I need a trim at all then then I'll put a bungee on the on the stick on the joystick. which will not only be lighter, but it'll, it'll be more efficient because you won't have a trim tab dangling in the airstream, uh, causing drag. I'm, I'm searching for lots of ways to save weight and drag. So the flaps, they're also gonna go. Uh, they're aluminium frame and they weigh quite a lot. Uh, so I'm gonna replace them with a fixed foam uh, flap. It'll be part of the wing, it won't be a flap anymore fixed foam covered in glass fibre, thin skin of glass fibre, again to save weight. And I won't need the, the drag of the flaps, they don't produce much lift, they produce drag. Well I won't need the drag because I'll have reverse thrust if I need it. And that's the only reason you have flaps on a shadow, to provide drag. It doesn't really improve the stall speed much, by one knot maybe. Um, these are the ailerons. Um, so lots of glue again, you can see it's pretty extensive on there. Um, the ailerons will stay unmodified, need them. This is a collection of all the bits that I don't need. So all the dual controls, um, obviously the flaps up here. Yeah, by removing the flaps, it not only saves weight in, in the structure of the flap, the foam is much lighter but it saves all of the the controls so the flap lever the teleflex cable um, 
and all the bracketry that's involved. And the other dual controls, the, well, the throttle lever. In fact, the throttle disappears completely, the front and back, because um, it'll just be a potentiometer with a speed control. So just removing the throttle save enough, saves an awful lot of weight. You save two throttle levers, and you save a, a metal bar, um, an aluminium uh, rod tube, which connects the two throttle levers. I'm also saving the fuel cutoff push rod. It goes from the co front cockpit right to the rear, the rear bulkhead. Um, the rear stick, control stick, and there are two steel rods. There's one for the torque tube for the ailerons, and there's one that connects the front stick to the rear stick for um, elevator. And they're both steel. They weigh a lot. They, they need to be steel because you've got two people possibly fighting against each other. A lot of force. Well, I don't need steel. It will only be one of me. Uh, the, the control forces are fairly light. So I'll replace that with aluminium. An aluminium torque tube. Won't need to push rod connecting the two. Um, all of these bits and pieces come out of the, uh, the side panniers. Uh, this is for routing the they're, they're plastic tubes for routing the rudder cables through uh, because there are two sets of rudder cables front and back well no longer need them rear pedals from the rear cockpit rear seat belt um, the voltage regulator don't need that I haven't got an engine battery box don't need that uh, that's the fuel shut off tank straps these are the EGT and uh, CHT sensors can I grab those? Because I'm not sure that mine work yet. Yeah. See me <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and the other radical thing, this is the tail skid. Um, the tail skid is, what, eight inches long or more? Um, and it has a strop wire on the fin. In case you hit the tail skid when you land, the strop wire stops the fin being ripped off backwards. Well, if you take the tail skid off, I think it's almost impossible to hit the fin on the ground. And that means you can get rid of the strop as well, the strop wire. So you say weight and drag. Well, so I'll be doing that. Even you flying it? Even with me flying it. <laughs> but I might put uh, a, a small wheel, small plastic lightweight wheel on the back just in case. So how much weight did you save by not having a fuel tank? Oh, the fuel tanks. The two fuel tanks are five kilograms four and a half five kilograms we'll come to that later <laughs> so an awful lot of weight oh this is the fuel pump of course <coughs> another view um, these are the wings one of the wings had the top surface already uncovered uh, there was something odd about it why why is it painted inside uh, they didn't do that in the factory I don't think this is number 35, so it was a very early shadow. Maybe they were doing that in the factory. And also the, the front D-box was covered in fabric, which is never the case. And I don't think it had been recovered. So maybe they were doing all of that in, in the early days in the shadow factory. Anyway, because of that, the, the plywood underneath was unpainted and it was really good, in really good condition been protected by the fabric. So I, I started uncovering the rest of it. The glue is very tough, very difficult to pull off. So the ply was pristine underneath. and I've taken the, the little bit of foam trailing edge off as well. This is a, the foam uh, insert that fits between the aileron and the flap. Uh, the replacement for the flap will be just an extension of this. So I'll take that off and make a long foam flap, fixed uh, flap. Wasn't stuck on very well. <laughs> and there was a great big gap. But then I suppose they had to do things fairly quickly in the factory. They never did make a profit. They went bust three times. 
So uh, it was all about making it as quickly as possible. This was a factory built aeroplane um, and I was surprised to see where the, the plywood is joined on the D box. It's, it's only about five feet long. It comes in, in um, sheets five feet long. So it has to be joined several times along the length of the wing. It was just overlapped and then filled, uh, the step was filled, which is guaranteed to show a crack in the paintwork after a while. Um, the normal process is to, is to um, uh, splice it, uh, to chamfer off the, the top layer to a feather edge um, as, it meets, as it meets the lower layer so that um, then you don't get a crack and you don't need so much filler either. There's enough overlap, be uh, this overlaps this one, there's enough overlap to be able to feather that off. So I'll be doing that. I'm going to remove the tips as well because they weigh uh, 800 grams each. They don't really do anything unless they were designed properly in a wind tunnel. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they won't uh, reduce the drag of the wing. And I'm sure that David Cook didn't design them in a wind tunnel, he just drew them. Uh, because it makes it look mean with these damn pointed <laughs> tips. This is a foam rib covered in glass fibre. I'll just skin the outside of that. So it's a fraction of the area of this. That'll save quite a bit of weight. Oh, again, this is unusual as well. I'm, I'm sure they didn't do this in the factory later on, but um, this is the D-box and the, the wing uh, strut attachment point. W when you put the fabric covering on, you overlap the D-box, of course, but there's nowhere to stick it here except onto the, onto the aluminium bracket. And again, um, I don't think they would have fitted this little web here in the factory unless they did in the early days again but that's obviously to provide a, a, a sheer gluing area for the fabric normally it would be glued to this bracket here but then it can be peeled off better to have a sheer uh, connection with the wing and typical of all shadows the, the plated steel pop rivets, wherever they're in contact with wood, have rusted. On uh, Hotel Tango, I re replaced all of these affected rivets with stainless steel, with the approval of the BMEA. Um, the stainless steel ones were stronger, so no problem. Right, now we're on to the fin. Um, I had to... Uh, rebuild part of the fin you can see this lower end it's it's uh, had some rain damage down here it was rotten the plywood was breaking up and and this rib was rotten right at the end so i had to replace the end of that rib splice a bit in and replace <laughs> the plywood webs luckily this rib was okay so i cleaned that up you can see the plywood is just disintegrating and again the, the rivets are rusty so Um, in actual fact, on the fin and on the rudder, um, I've decided not to put the rivets back, except on this aluminium plate at the top, which is the most highly stressed bit, um, because the aerodite is still bonded, it's still uh, attached. It's really good aerodite. It, it was the strongest aerodite that they made at the time. And there's no need for the rivets. I'm, I'm sure that the CAA came along and insisted on the rivets, but David Cook wouldn't have wanted to put them in uh, because they look so unsightly through the fabric once it's covered. Um, so as it's going to be SSDR, uh, I can do what I want. <laughs> I'm going to leave them off. It's not a highly stressed area, so I'm fairly confident it will be fine. Again, it saves weight and it makes it uh, it gives it a better appearance and saves a bit, little bit of drag, not much. Now I've got a problem here. Um, the fin post 
in common with a lot of shadows it's seized in the boom I just can't budge it um, and on top of that the um, the joints the glued joints of the ribs uh, have broken away and that's fairly common as well so it's very difficult to put any force um, on this apart from the the main tube so I'm thinking of other ways of getting this out uh, one way is to try and hammer it from the top so I thought maybe the piece of wood uh, judiciously positioned to resist the, um, the hammer blow I can then put a, a tube in the top which uh, presses on the space of tube inside uh, sorry the doubler tube inside uh, which is riveted onto the main tube so if those I think four rivets hold this might work let's see So with a little help from my glamorous assistant, I did eventually get it out, but we tried that first with a great big sledgehammer. But all that did is to shear the rivets and push the doubler tube down, so it didn't work. So then we tried a socket on top, which just fits inside there. And we broke the the seas uh, enough to start turning it and waggling it out. But we had to drive it out most of the way with this socket. Anyway, job done. Um, bit of damage, but easily repaired. It did what I expected. The rivet sheared because that's pushing on the spacer tube. Uh, sorry, the doubler tube inside. Um, and it sheared four steel rivets, hitting it with a small sledgehammer. It wasn't corroded as I thought it might be. It was old um, oil and grease which had solidified. But so what we did was put a socket in the end to fit the, the fin tube. Uh, I drove it out with a belt from a sledgehammer. But it did go eventually. And it didn't damage anything which was important. Because we... Uh, You'll know Mick replacing that tube in the boom, the swaged tube is tricky. I'm uh, quite used to building new fins, by the way, having wiped one off. <laughs> so this is um, uh, taking the old one apart. Um, most of the woodwork was fine. I think I replaced a couple of, yes, I replaced a couple of uh, webs uh, again at the bottom where where they'd been affected by rain um, and put it together with Aerodite's uh, 2005 which is what was originally used uh, without the rivets again uh, that was the the rotted uh, rib in in the rudder the lower end so that's a finished fin oh might just be worth talking about these webs here these, these ribs are normally just glued on to the tubes without any reinforcement. So I reinforced with, with these plywood webs. I did it on Hotel Tango when I uh, refurbished that and it, it's held really well. So it's just aerodite, no, no rivets. This, this is the finished rudder with no rivets, um, all cleaned up and bits and pieces of plywood renewed. Oh, again. Um, I've reinforced the end rib with foam because that gets pulled in by the fabric. Um, I thought everybody would like to see how a boom comes off. So it's it's only connected with well three bolts, two sh short bolts here, and a, a long stud back here. So it's a single bolt with nut on either end. Uh, both of these connect onto the boom. This one via these plates. And in the past, on at least two uh, 
uh, shadows that this plate is cracked along here due to flexing fatigue um, that's what that little um, modification is the bit of plywood between the plates here that's what that's all about to stop these flexing from side to side so uh, then the boom with the centre wing attached um, so these these plates um, are attached to the boom uh, and you have to unbolt these of course before the boom will come out and also the boom is attached to a big U channel at the front here so that has to be unbolted so there are eight nuts and bolts to undo and they're fairly difficult to get to but uh, anyway we did that and then the boom can be well before pulling the boom out you have to then disconnect uh, the bracket back here this bracket connects to the boom on the other side of the boom with four rivets so you have to drill those rivets out and then the boom will pull out with a bit of a struggle from the, the plywood uh, shear web spar shear web and then if we place the boom upright, you can see just how long it is. Wow. Although I'm not moving the boom, I am going to be a bit more radical because it's an SSDR, so uh, I don't have to go through the approval process. Uh, it's never going to be a two-seater again, so it's going to be a pure single seater which means I can cut the rear bulkhead down this is normally out here so slimming down the rear bulkhead to the width of the two aluminium down tubes that connect up to the boom will uh, reduce the well reduce the width of the airplane of the fuselage at the rear and make it much easier to taper it to a point a really streamlined point that's the worst thing about a shadow is the rear bulkhead such a bluff rear bulkhead, it's very draggy. Um, tapering off the rear of the fuselage will, will improve the aerodynamics enormously and it'll improve the flow into the propeller, which is the important thing. So I've cut the fiber lamb rear bulkhead down. Uh, I've cut the, the armrests as well back to nothing at the rear. There's a, a slight curve so that they start from the original width at the front and uh, taper to nothing at the rear. And then I, I'm just using these tubes to give an idea of where the fuselage will come to a point. The motor will be mounted somewhere here. Um, the battery's inside the, the enclosed rear end. And so that the flow into the propeller will be much better. The next thing, as it's only a single seat, uh, uh, we don't need a footwell in the back. So removing that saves weight and drag again. So. I want to take that off. Um, I don't know why, but wherever there's a hard point for the seat belts or the down tubes, uh, it was painted yellow in, inside. It's made in the factory. I don't know why they did that. Corrosion protection, I don't know. But uh, uh, the worst thing was that this rear point here on the left hand side, which supports the the down tube from the boom so it's an important anchorage point you've got four of these connecting the <coughs> cockpit to the rest of the aeroplane this one here it's a hard point which is made up of two pieces that go either side of the fiber lamp and they they push together uh, they're made of aluminium they're, they're designed to provide a hard point in fiber lamp well this one had been pulled in so far it had broken through this skin of the fiber lamp and was below the surface um, so I presume that they must have reinforced that after do doing that damage in the factory <laughs> to make sure that was strong enough because you could uh, separate from the wing if that wasn't strong enough um, so I might uh, have to take that apart and investigate what what's that all, all about it's very holes in the fiber lamp which has reduced its strength uh, for switches, uh, master switch and ignition switches. It's on the right hand armrest. So I'll be filling those in. The uh, rear, uh, well, 
As you can see, I've tapered off the armrest here to nothing at the back. This is the back bulkhead. This is where the rudder, rear rudder pulley used to be. Obviously, there's no room for that now because I'm cutting away the, the fiber lamp. So I'm going to mount it on the inside. But rather than use that double pulley, I'll use one of the front pulleys, which is a single. I'll probably have to mount it in a slot this side so that um, so that it fits flush with this with this skin of the fiber lamp, and then the um, the pulley will be slightly proud to accept the the rudder wire from the pedals. And these these sides are normally covered in uh, plywood, 1.2 millimeter plywood. But now it, now I've cut that away. Um, it's a more complex 3D shape, so I can't really do it in plywood without a lot of work. Uh, like a mosquito is a, a 3D shape made of plywood, but that's very complicated. So I'm going to cover these in fabric instead, and that will save another 600 grams, I think it is, for the two. I don't know why David Cook put the pitot tube up here. I suppose because uh, when you take the extension off, then it, nothing's sticking out and it doesn't, uh, it will fit inside a trailer without it getting damaged and people walking past can't knock it. But I found that on Hotel Tango, um, I put it right on the nose like a glider and then you don't need a pitot tube, you just need a hole and it works perfectly. So I'll be doing that. So yeah, removing the rear doors, don't need them. They're gonna be um, covered in, in fabric um, so two and a half kilograms save there um, and I, as I was saying the front canopy is well it used to be one millimeter when they first made the shadow but uh, there were a few incidences where they caved in there's a famous uh, clash with a tornado in the in the Lake District I think it was uh, somebody was flying a shadow and saw a little dot in the sky which rapidly turned into a tornado coming straight at them it pulled up at the last minute and the jet blast caved in the canopy and put the wings on a negative G which made them jerk forward like that and it crushed the leading edge. Um, he survived, he landed it, but the RAF paid for the repairs. So that had a one millimetre canopy. Um, I'll revert to one millimetre. The, 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 uh, most shadows now have 1.5 millimetres. But it saves uh, about three quarters of a kilogram, just changing down to one mil. I've got the original uh, nylon wheels, which are lighter, so they'll stay. Uh, you can't put as much pressure in, in these wheels as the later aluminium ones, but that's fine. Pretty standard uh, instrument panel layout, except for this big hole here, which was a, a globe uh, compass. I've laid out all the things that I'm going to take off um, to make this a true SSDR. It's, it's never go going to be converted back to a two-seater. Um, and I wanted to save as much weight as possible and as much drag as possible. Because of the, both of those things mean more endurance for an electric aeroplane. So the first thing is the front canopy. Um, which is going to be reduced from 1.5 mil thick to 1 mil as the original shadows were. Next to the brake uh, pedals. I'm thinking of taking the brakes off completely because I'll have reverse thrust. Then we've got all the dual controls. So we've got throttle control and the rear throttle control. We've got the fuel shutoff valve with a long torque tube that goes right to the back. And we've got 
this red um, Teleflex cable, which is the flaps and the flap lever inside the cockpit, plus the choke lever. And the two flap push rods at the back, which connect to the flaps. There's a plastic conduit here, a tube for the rudder cables to pass through so that it doesn't tangle, but I think I can improve on that. Um, I won't need such a long conduit, probably just enough to go through the foam ribs. The rear pulleys, which were twin pulleys, will be discarded and I'll use the front pulleys, uh, which were for the passengers' feet, back here. Um, I can't mount them where they used to be mounted, with the cable running in the back bulkhead and behind the back bulkhead, because these will be outside the line of the panniers now, uh, because I've cut away the pannier. So I'm going to mount them inside, that way round, fed through from this side, so that um, they're actually mounted on this surface here, but uh, they protrude through into the cockpit. That's the fuel shutoff valve. Um, little plate for the, uh, I think that's for the choke cable to come out of or the throttle cable, can't remember. The pylon sides, they're quite heavy, they're 2.5mm plywood. The pylon will be covered in fabric instead. Seat belt, rear seat belt, and the plates that um, it's connected to on the, on the forward side of the bulkhead. These are the five lamp pieces that I've removed from the rear bulkhead and and from the pannier sides. The trim, complete, the trim tab and the wiring, push rod, servo, plate to mount the servo on, switch, display, all of that saves quite a bit of weight. This is going to be very much a one-speed aeroplane, so uh, if I do need a trim, I'll use a bungee on the control stick in the cockpit. Battery box, I don't need that anymore. I'll have a much bigger battery with bigger boxes. The voltage regulator, rectifier, I don't need that anymore either. Nor any of the engine. Um, ancillaries, so EGT um, probes for instance, fuel pump, and I'm not quite sure what that is there. I think that may be a, an electrical shutoff valve or possibly a, a fuel pressure gauge uh, sensor. Pull start pulleys. Throttle cables, um, choke cables, all these hoses, of course, there are more hoses than that. Brakes and all the cables, that's a lot of weight. I can save um, quite a lot of weight by taking the brakes off. Rear tank strap, rear pedals, pulleys that go on the back of the the front bulkhead for the passenger pulley, uh, passenger uh, foot pedals, the rear stick, again one of these conduits, and there's a, a hefty steel bar connecting the front and rear sticks because uh, it has to resist the combined effort of two people. And of course the the, the um, torque rod for the ailerons that has to possibly resist the combined effort of two people. So that's steel as well. 
So these, these two are pretty heavy, that one can go. This I shall replace with aluminium and it'll be much shorter as well because I can't use the original position for this bell crank here which is just beyond the rear bulkhead um, because there's no pannier here there's no pannier thickness to feed that through so it's going to end somewhere here and the push rod up to the the aileron jack shaft will go from this point here so this will be shorter and it will be aluminium these horrible old-fashioned vents with rusty screws there are much better uh, one-piece polycarbonate vents nowadays the master switch and ignition switch that'll be simplified and it won't go in that big hole either I should patch that these are um, navigation lights and a strobe which I've taken off I don't need them not going to be flying at night um, and some inspection hatches uh, they were for the the aileron bell cranks and the wings, I think. Here's the aileron jack shaft. So rather than being actuated from the rear, uh, just outside the rear bulkhead, I shall move the jack shaft forward and this will be inside the cockpit now. These are the flaps, well, and the, the foam inserts between the flap and the aileron. So I'm removing these aluminium framed flaps and the foam inserts, and I'm going to replace them both with fixed foam sections, trailing edge sections. I don't need flaps. If I need the drag, I've got reverse thrust and it saves a lot of weight. There were two trim tabs, one on an aileron and one on the rudder. Uh, I don't think I'm going to need them. We'll make sure it's trimmed properly. The tail skid. I'm going to remove that because that's eight or more inches long you're more likely to hit the the tail on the ground if if you've got this long tail skid on so I'll take that off and then I won't need the the strop wire because it's unlikely to hit the ground uh, the strop wire is only for ground strikes it's not um, it doesn't come into effect in in the air at all so I won't need that either on the on the fin This is um, a jewellery strut with the brackets that uh, attach it to the wing and the lift strut. I'm going to leave those off. The jewellery strut it, it, uh, is there to stop the lift strut from buckling in negative G or um, if you hit the ground hard. Well, I'm willing to accept damage if I hit the ground that hard. And the rear doors, they can go completely, that saves an awful lot of weight. The other one over there. So I think that's about it. I probably haven't covered everything but uh, there'll be future videos. So in total, I think I'll be able to save 25 kilograms um, with all of that lot plus the tanks. Um, and the engine weighs, what, 40 odd kilograms? Can I ask you how much does the fuel weigh? 
how much fuel weighs. I know you can go into electric, so you obviously don't have to carry fuel. Yeah, uh, well, it will carry 54 litres, which is about 36, 37 kilograms of fuel. Uh, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, huge amount of weight can be saved, um, which is useful because the batteries will weigh 70 kilograms. The motor isn't very heavy at all, 12 kilograms for that, and it's quite small. Adrian, can I ask how many uh, electric shadows exist already? Is it a, is it a popular thing? Or? There are no electric shadows. So is this the first one? Oh yeah. There are very few electric microlights, yeah. um, and they're experimental. Um, they're not fully practical for long trips because you can't carry enough batteries. But I reckon, um, well, a shadow is an ideal candidate because you can strip a lot of weight off, yeah. turn it into a single seater, and um, it's got a very big wing, which means it can fly slowly, efficiently, using very little power. Yeah. And so uh, then you can carry enough batteries, I reckon, for nearly two hours duration, which is pretty good, really, for an el electric aeroplane. Um, and then once, once I proved it on a single-seater, deregulated aircraft, um, which you can do. You can do anything to an SSDR. Um, you don't have to have approval from the authorities. So I'll, I'll experiment on this, get it all working and reliable, and then go back to the British Microlight Association um, and ask them about converting a two-seat shadow with full approval. Um, and then you'll, you'll still have nearly two hours duration in a two-seat shadow, but when you're flying solo, you can put more batteries in. You can double the amount of batteries you put in, so three or four hours duration. But it's going to take a little while for the regulations to catch up because they're not written with electric power in mind. They're written for internal combustion engines. Um, and the authorities are a bit wary at the moment of um, the batteries especially. The motors are perfectly reliable, uh, much more reliable than an engine. So we haven't got the problems of car biasing and all, all sorts of other things. Lots of things can go wrong with an engine. Um, nothing much can go wrong with an electric motor. It's got two simple bearings, one rotating rotor, and that's it. So the only thing that can go wrong with it is if it gets too hot. Is the problem with the batteries, they tend to combust? No, no. <laughs> uh, the ones that are used in model aeroplanes, radio-controlled model aeroplanes, they, they're very high uh, energy density, yeah. and if you charge or discharge them too quickly, they can get hot and they can burst into flames. These are different lithium-ion batteries, they're, they're not as power dense. It's much easier to keep they're them within... Safe. Yeah, they're pretty safe. Um, the only way of uh, setting fire to them, really, is to, is to charge them extremely rapidly, which <coughs> generates heat, or to dis discharge them extremely ra rapidly. Well, I won't be doing that. Um, and I'll be monitoring the temperatures. Can you go short? Uh, you'll have a fuse, you'll have a... Yeah. <laughs> So it'll be engineered so that nothing can go wrong. <laughs> and in the cockpit, <laughs> in the cockpit, I'll have a display showing temperatures of the motor and the batteries, uh, the voltages of the battery as well, because you can damage them if you go too low, discharge them too much, or charge them too high. So all of that will be monitored in the cockpit. I think you've made loads of progress from last time. Certainly. From last year? Well, I didn't have a spare shadow last year. But uh, December time onwards, I think, certainly when I actually spoke to you. I didn't get much done over the winter yeah. because it involves a lot of work outside and it was cold. Yeah. Um, so. And I was doing lots of um, calculations, aerodynamic calculations, to see what power I, I needed for slow speed flight. So. Yeah. so I've got a big fancy spreadsheet now with all the predictions on it. <laughs> Well, I'm aiming to do the airframe uh, renovation by next spring, and that, I think that's doable. Um, and then I'm, I know exactly the motor and the batteries I'm going to use, but I haven't bought them yet. I'm waiting for the pound to improve, because they come from <laughs> Europe, um, and I'll buy them next spring, probably. But that part of it is 
relatively straightforward. I, I've, um, as a project, to uh, get some experience with the batteries, I've converted a bicycle to electric power. You can buy motor kits from China. Um, but I've made the battery up myself out of the cells that I'll use in this. Um, because I wanted to get experience of, of running those cells and looking after them, looking at the temperatures and voltages and things. And it's worked out really well. Um, they're very good quality cells. Um, they don't overheat. Um, they're very, very easy to keep within the voltage limits. Um, so I think it's going to be, it's going to be fine. So are you going to use solar, you know, to charge that? You know, I know you're in well, the airfield, so you're going to use solar to charge at the airfield? The ideal, um, because we haven't got power at the airfield, mm. the ideal would be to store this in a, well, I'm, I'm buying a shipping container to store it in, to put solar panels on the roof, All right. and then every time I go back to the airfield to fly, it will be yeah. charged up, hopefully. Yeah. It'll easily charge in a couple of days from solar panels. Very few solar panels. Um, so free flying from that point of view. So I haven't talked much about the electrical side until just now, but uh, I've been concentrating on the airframe, getting that in shape. Um, but it's going well. It should be done by next spring. Um, the Hotel Tango out there is covered in Oritex. Um, you may have seen it. It's a, a lightweight pre-finished fabric which you um, use a heat sensitive glue and you iron it on to set the glue to stick it in place and then you iron over the fabric to shrink it. Uh, and that's it. You don't have to dope it and paint it. It's completely pre-finished and it's very lightweight. And I was thinking of using that, but it's gone up in price. And now, if I was to do that, it probably cost three thousand pounds to cover it. Um, but I've been collaborating with somebody who's restoring another shadow, and I suggested to him something I'd heard from other people to cover it in lightweight Dacron, and then paint it with Dulux Weather Shield. It's an it's an exterior woodwork paint, but it's flexible, which is what you want for fabric. It's, um, it resists the sun, it has to be outside permanently. It's guaranteed for seven years in permanent sun and rain. Um, and it's, it's turned out really well. He's, he's covered it in lightweight Dacron, painted it with uh, Dulux Weather Shield with a roller instead of spraying it. And it's a fantastic finish, really good. So I should be doing that. Instead of costing 3,000 pounds, it's gonna cost 300. It'll be a bit heavier, but um, I'm saving so much weight, I don't mind uh, sparing that. Yeah, I think we've, we've done that to death. <laughs> Any more questions? What well, um, voltage are you going to be running um, Yeah, um, the motor I'm using is, um, well, peak power if you run it at its maximum speed, which is over 6,000 revs, would be over 100 horsepower. Um, but I should be running it at about half that, less than 3,000 revs, uh, because I only need 50 horsepower max. And most of the time, I only need about 15. It'll be direct drive. It'll be direct drive, because I don't want the complication of a reduction drive. I want to make it as reliable as possible. So it's an oversized motor running at half its rate, less than half its rated power. So it won't get hot, it won't need special cooling, uh, it'll be ultra reliable because there's nothing much to go wrong with it. Um, it weighs 12 kilograms, it's about um, 8, 10 inches diameter, pretty small. Um, and at those sorts of revs I shall need about 110, 115 volts. The batteries are going to be made up in four separate blocks in four separate boxes, adding up to 115 volts. Um, so each, they weigh 70 kilograms in total, each block will weigh about 17 and a half, so easily pick up uh, You could take them home if you needed to, to charge. Um, they'll be in carbon fiber boxes probably, homemade carbon fiber boxes. Uh, so each one of them is only 28 volts or something, uh, you're not going to get a shock from that. 
you might get a shock from 115, but it'll all be shielded and there'll be no chance of, uh, of getting a shock. Teslas, Tesla cars, use about 400 volts. Um, Porsche, with their electric Taycan sports car, that uses 800 volts. That would kill you. <laughs> So you've got to be pretty careful, but 115 volts is, is okay. Is it brushed or is it brushless? No, it's a modern brushless AC motor, fantastically efficient. Um, a 503 is 25% efficient, so you're chucking away, for 50 horsepower, you're chucking away 150 horsepower in heat at max power. You've got to deal with that heat. Um, so that's why it's got the fan on it. Uh, an electric motor, one of these electric motors is 96, 97% efficient. You're only chucking away three or 4% in heat. So heat's not a problem, just airflow across it will keep it cool. How heavy is the controller? That's all it's about seven kilograms. Uh, the motor's 12, batteries are 70, plus a bit for the boxes. And it's all fairly well available. It's all, it's not, none of it's experimental. It, yeah. it's, uh, it's fairly common. I think we'll leave it there, shall we?